what are the odds that two people have the same dad joke prepared? Well, if you both Googled it, highly likely. <laughs> I mean, no, Google's guilty. never wrong. Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and this week we are switching things up. I am not joined by my co-host Matt and Dana. I am instead joined by a troop of other amazing content creators. First up from the CMDR Central podcast, it is the self-proclaimed scumbag Max Crandall. Hey Joey, thanks for having me on. And if you didn't know, like the gods of Theros, if your devotion is less than seven, I am not a creature. That is refreshing to hear, Max. I'm not going to lie. I thought that you were about to attack me <laughs> with a dad joke, but instead you just went with a bad joke. So yes. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Also, hailing from the Commander Cookout podcast up there in the Great White North, we've got the absurdly kind and astonishingly vulgar Ryan Peneff. No vulgarity here, but you know, Joey, the shovel was a groundbreaking invention. Oh, there's the yeah. dad joke. <laughs> oh, I knew I knew that it was about to happen. Uh, of course. And finally, he's here from the Commander Social podcast and his last name is probably the best color in magic right now. We've got Ryan Green. Hey, all right. Thanks for having me. OK, so why did DePaula want to be friends with Nissa? Why? <laughs> because she wanted to know what kind of vehicles were on Zendikar. <laughs> All three oh. of you got me with the jokes. That I'm, I feel very attacked right now. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. <laughs> uh, so what is everyone doing here? Well, every time a new set comes out, there are so many new cool cards, but it's really tough for one show to do justice to all of them. And since this is Theros, the land of Greek and Roman myth, we thought that we would actually go on an epic odyssey of our own. So CMDR Central, Commander Cookout, Commander Social, and the EDH Rec cast have joined up to embark on an epic set review to cover the most interesting new Commander cards from Theros Beyond Death. All week long, we've had crossover shows from each one of these different podcasts, starting off with Max. Yeah, on Monday, CMDR Central had Brando from Commander Cookout on, and we covered all the non-legendary creatures that Theros Beyond Death has to offer. Then on Tuesday, Brando and myself, along with Zach from Commander Social, did Instance, Sorceries, Planeswalkers. All right, and on Wednesday, Commander Social had this uh, cast's very own Matt Morgan on to talk about artifacts, enchantments, and lands. And now we are at the grand finale, where we've all convened to discuss the brand new legendary creatures from the set. So remember, this is part four of the epic crossover. So listeners, if you want to get the full experience, go back and find these guys' shows to get the review of the entire set. And in fact, let's run real quick through each of your social media coordinates, guys. Where can listeners find your shows? Max, let's start off with you. Uh, we are on Twitter, Facebook, and Google by searching Commander Central. And Ryan... Penef, not Ryan Green, where can we find you? We are at CCO Podcast and CCO Brando on Twitter. We are Facebook.com slash CCO Podcast. We are Commander Cookout Podcast on YouTube and, of course, CommanderCookout.com. <laughs> and finally, Ryan Green. All right. Well, you can find us on Twitter at Commander Social. Individually, I'm at Green Geek, and my amazing co-host, Zach, is at Z4CK38. Absolutely. So listeners, you can go and find those shows to get the full experience for this crossover. But now we are here to talk about the legendary creatures from Theros Beyond Death. Let's find out which of these are going to make some really awesome commanders. Let's start off with the uncommon legendary creatures, because guys, there are so many legendary Ooh. creatures in this set. It almost feels like we're back on Dominaria or something. Let's start off with these uncommon ones. First up is you, Max. First up, then, is uh, Daxos, Blessed by the Sun. He's too white for a legendary enchantment creature demigod. Uh, Daxos's toughness is equal to your devotion to white, so he starts out as a 2-2. And he also has, whenever another creature you control enters the battlefield or dies, you gain a life. This card right here is really interesting to me. It fits into a lot of the white weenie strategies. Um... Especially the fact that, you know, white is known for the ETB gain of life for creatures, but now adding the dies clause on it, I think pushes the mono white strategy a little ahead of the curve. Yeah, definitely reminiscent of those soul sisters. Do you think that you would play Daxos at the head of its own deck, though? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> he goes in the 99, Joey, in the 99. 
Uh, yeah, that's a little unfortunate. There's always, you know, when we see a mono white legendary creature, we kind of hope that there will be something, you know, really interesting, really compelling, a little innovative. Uh, but it doesn't look like Daxos is adding necessarily too much to the conversation at the head of the deck, but more joining the realm of the Soul Sisters, like Soul Warden and Soul's Attendant and stuff like that, which are really great in, you know, commanders like Karloff or what have you. But it's a little unfortunate. He is an uncommon and probably won't be seeing play in too many decks of his own. So with the addition of Daxos to that Soul Sisters archetype i think we have to call them the soul siblings now is that right oh that sounds <laughs> correct yes it sounds correct and it's still alliteration which i appreciate the other thing i wanted to say about this guy is i'm so 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 happy that this isn't a black white card and being mono white it, it makes it feel kind of like the white version of blood artist and it's legendary to boot, which some cards in white do care about it, like loyal retainers or whatever, if you're gonna if you're gonna go that route. The dies trigger is a good thing to note there. That does make it definitely distinct. So there are probably some synergies that I'm overlooking just because I'm so used to the regular soul warden effects and I'm not used to the dies trigger on the life gain. So that's a really good observation. I like well, that. Well in, in in your token decks, you get them you get them on the way in and the way out now instead of just on the way in. I'm waiting for the pay one when it dies to draw a card mentor of the meek when it dies. Ooh, Ooh. that'd be nice. Yeah, I'm super into that. At the same time, though, soul sisters or soul siblings, I really want to sing Hey Sister, Soul Sister every time that I play a card like this. So that's just going to be my personal preference. <laughs> so we're going to move on now to our next uncommon legend. This one's also a legendary enchantment creature demigod. This is Calafi, Beloved of the Sea. She costs one blue blue and is a star three, where the power, the star, is equal to your devotion to blue. So she starts off as a two three. She says that creatures and enchantments you control have spells your opponents cast that target this permanent cost one more to cast guys i gotta level with you i do not like this legendary creature very much it just doesn't seem very compelling the taxation effect on targeting your creatures and enchantments is just so minor that i don't think it's going to stop much at all i feel like this one should be white too <laughs> that's I... kind of become the meme now oh this could have been a white card <laughs> i mean i happen to agree with a lot of the things that i see in those memes but yeah i'm just not personally very enthralled by Calvary. oh that, yeah that's not even what i meant it's it's, it's terrible it should be a white card no that's not <laughs> what i meant what i meant was taxation i know the way that this is taxing is kind of blues wheelhouse but i know i mean if we're gonna tax we should just give it to white so they can have all the best stacks cards and all the worst ones too oh wow shots fired <laughs> All right, who is our next legendary creature? All right, well, up next we've got Tiramit, Chosen from Death. This is Black Black for a legendary enchantment creature, Demigod. It's a two power star toughness creature, and it says Timurit's toughness is equal to your devotion to black. And then one in a black colon exile up to two target cards from graveyards. You gain one life for each creature exiled this way. Um, so this card immediately reminded me of Withered Wretch. Um, from way back in the day and that card's actually really good in commander um i don't know that you really want this as your commander but if you've got a whole bunch of graveyard decks in your meta you could do worse and yeah uh withered wretch only has a uh, generic mana to pay so that's better than this but it only gets one card at a time so you're effectively still only paying two here and it's gonna have a lot more toughness so maybe it can gum up the ground and keep graveyards at bay so it's kind of doing two things which i like I don't like it, but it also says Exile and Graveyard <laughs> on it, so that was kind of a given. I feel like he's just talking right at you, Joey, in the card art. Like he's coming <laughs> for your graveyards. Uh, please, please, <laughs> please, no. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm as sold on this one on Timurit. He doesn't look all that compelling to me. In terms of, you know, black legendary creatures that can do stuff, even involving exiling stuff in the graveyard, I'm just not sure that Timurit really takes the cake for me. It might be a decent include in Kethis of the Hidden Hand. Ooh, that's actually a good point. It going into that legendary matters kind of ability and also getting some grave hate for your enemies. That's a really good place for it. I love that. All right, let's move on to our next commander. Who is this? This is Annex Hardened by the Forge. This is Red Red 1 for a Star 3 demigod. The first demigod, I would add, that shouldn't be white. Timurit should be white as well. <laughs> wow. Whenever Annex or another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one red satyr creature token with this creature can't block. If the creature had power 4 or greater, create two of those tokens instead. This one, I think, is good. Red doesn't, I think, really have a 
good tokens commander yet outside of anything goblin, including Zada, where I would actually put this card in certain builds that want to cast the cards like, uh, I think it's Zap from Invasion that deal one damage to a a zada creature and then it radiates to everything if any of those everythings would die annex is going to replace them and you're still going to draw all those cards off of a card like zap or spawning breath so this I mean, one is good in in a meta or or sorry in a build that i already am familiar with yeah that definitely seems like a cool place for it at the helm of the deck though are you as compelled no i think again <laughs> it's a 99er and that's Maybe, maybe unless you find some way to make a whole bunch of tokens in red, maybe other Theros cards are going to give that to us. I'm not sure. Yeah, it seems a little less compelling to me, too. We're starting off with some of the soft hitters in the set, I would say, especially with this particular uncommon demigod cycle. Uh, and speaking of which, we've got one more in this cycle. Ryan, do you want to walk us through it? Yeah, last one. This is Renata called to the hunt sounds like a restaurant where i'm from it's a <laughs> it's a star three i should have mentioned uh, annex is a star three if i didn't say that as well star three devotion to green power green green two each creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it so a little bit toothy no sorry a little bit peer right sort of but they don't need a counter when they enter the battlefield Regardless, they're going to get one, right? It doesn't strike me so much as pure imaginative rascal so much as it reminds me of Grumgully the Generous from the previous Throne of Eldraine set. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, there, there's there's another one, yep. Yeah. Because he, you know, made your non-human creatures enter with plus one counters on them. Renata is just a mono green version of that. So notably, this can go infinite with effects that have persist, since the minus one counter will be negated by the plus one counter. So we're talking about Woodfall Primus. Is that the only one, though? I don't think that that's the only one. I think there might even be an artifact creature that has Persist, but it could easily be the case that a Renato deck isn't just there to buff up a couple of creatures with a few tiny plus one counters. It might actually be a combo deck if you see it across the table from you. Yeah, it's going to play like 12 or 13 different green tutor effects, including all the elf ones. It's going to elf for mana, and then it's going to kill you with Woodfall Primus. Is that, what we're, is that what we're doing here? Is this the best one? I mean, in terms of sheer combo. Yeah. I would agree. I think it's the best one. Well, uh, and the card I'm thinking of to go with this is Cauldron of Souls, um, which is a four mana or <laughs> five mana artifact that you can tap and give any number of creatures persist until end of turn. That's the one with Grumgully. Now, do they, when they die and then come back, they're a new object. They don't still have persist, correct? Correct. But that is a really nice way to keep your army sort of continually eternal. So that can also be a pretty compelling thing for it, too. All in all, though, I'm not sure that I like it more than Grumgully. Time will tell. I do suspect that this probably becomes a combo engine more than anything if people build it. But I'm also not sure that people will build it more than they built Grumgully. No, they won't. Let's move on now to... I gotta admit, you guys, I actually really, really like this card, even though it's crazy. This is another uncommon legend, but we're out of the demigod cycle. We're looking now at Illyrios Enraptured. This is also a three mana creature. It's so obnoxious, you guys. So it is a two, three human, and it says that Illyrios Enraptured enters the battlefield tapped. And Illyrios doesn't untap during your untap step if you control a reflection. And when Illyrios enters the battlefield, you create a three, two blue reflection creature token. This is so janky, but bear with me on this one. Mirror and Reflection Tribal. You build a pure narcissism deck because that's who this character is representing, Narcissus, who fell in love with his own reflection. So you fill the entire deck with cards that say mirror on it, like Mirage Mirror, or cards that say reflection on it, like Infinite Reflection, so you can make nothing but reflections. I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of into this idea. <laughs> I think it's really funny. Nice, wow. you can throw Mirror Maid in there too. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There's a surprising number of these. I'm totally, even clones could become copies of the reflections. because I he was loves just going to say that. <laughs> exactly. It's pure jank. It's not that great, but I'm kind of here for it. I, I really genuinely, of all of the commanders in this set, I'm not going to lie, I might actually build this one. Listen, as soon because... as as soon as you put 10 or 12 clones in a deck, that deck becomes good because it's going to, if you're not copying a reflection or a mirror or what have you, you're going to pick the best thing on the table. And 10 or 12 versions of the best thing on the table is always good. I, I think you misunderstand my commitment to the meme here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I will only copy my own reflections in my own Illyrios. Oh, no. I think that's a my, thing that I will indeed do. My only stipulation is the every card has to have this card art on it if you're going to copy it. 
oh my goodness, like redo <laughs> all of the art to be just him. I, I'm actually really into this. And Ryan Peneff, you are an <laughs> alterer of card art. I might enlist you. Listen, for help listen, on we'll just get different versions of Aliro's doing selfies. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's phenomenal. It's got to find right. his lighting and his angles. All right, let's move on to our next commander. This is Siona. Yeah, so Siona, Captain of the Pileys, is one green and a white for a 2-2 legendary creature human soldier. Uh, she reads, when Siona, Captain of the Pileys, enters the battlefield, look at the top seven cards of your library. You may reveal an aura card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. She also reads, whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a creature you control, create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. So this card, there are two very unique clauses on this card. The fact that it only cares about auras is very unique for all those enchantress decks out there. Most of them are either an aura-based Voltron strategy or the get a bunch of enchantments on the board to do like a Starfield and Nyx uh, shenanigans. The fact that this only looks for auras means this might not go into every enchantress build out there. And the fact that the aura actually has to resolve and attach to something you control to get that token is a really unique design space, in my opinion. It doesn't necessarily have to resolve. It just needs to become attached. True. So w when something enters the battlefield and you move an aura, okay. and that's going to give you a, a token, which then you can move an aura to, and it becomes attached, you get another token. So this is a little bit of a combo engine as well. Right, there's that card, Shielded by Faith, which gives the enchanted creature indestructible, and when you get another creature, you can move the Shielded by Faith onto the new creature, which will also trigger Siona. So that goes infinite with all of the tokens, which is pretty crazy, actually, not gonna lie. Ooh, that's nice. That's right. I, here, I got, I, got one, I got one for you as well here with Replenish. If you are, <laughs> of course, Replenish is broken, we all know that, but if you can stock your graveyard, and of, of course you're gonna stock your graveyard in a, a white-green deck, if if you can stock your graveyard then replenish and you get back something like Beastmaster Ascension, Concordant Crossroads, and a whole bunch of auras with your replenish, you're going to trigger this card a whole bunch of times, all your tokens are going to have haste, and then they're all going to be able to attack because Concordant Crossroads, and they're all going to get big because Beastmaster Ascension. This is a pretty cool little card. You're talking graveyards, and I'm not going to lie, I'm here for it. <laughs> That's it. And I'm talking in white-green. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the cards that jumped out to me were Oratog, which lets you sacrifice any enchantment to give it plus two, plus two until end of turn. And then something like oh. Ranker, which you could just like sack oh. over and over and over again and make a bunch of tokens. Yeah. Not going to lie, this is a lot <laughs> spicier than I thought it would be. I actually kind of like that. There's a lot of hidden utility on Sayona here. Uh, who is our next commander, though? Uh, our next one is Eutropia, the twice favored. It's a for one green and a blue for a legendary creature, human wizard. It has a 2 2 body. It has Constellation, the returning mechanic. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. That creature gains flying until end of turn. Oofta, this is a, this is a game winner sometimes, I think, guys. Really? I'm not very compelled. Oh, giving something plus one, plus one counter, not just till the end of turn, it gets the real counter. And sometimes flying is what you need to get through, Joey. Yeah, but who needs to fly when you could just use the underworld and revive everything from the dead? I don't understand. Why aren't you playing graveyards? Because <laughs> we don't need to, Joey. That's why. Didn't didn't you just hear my last example, Max? <laughs> okay, Max, get, get this, Max. You you got the uh, you've got the Bant Enchantress deck. I, I think do. you put both of these in. You put your replenish in, and you just go to town, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can actually see that, especially in the 99 of those Enchantress decks. At the helm, I'm not as compelled, but I can definitely see people using it uh, the way that you described. I guess my hesitation is just that a lot of the enchantment payoffs that I see tend to be things like Sigil of the Empty Throne, which already produces flying creatures, or you use a lot of auras on Tuvasa, for example, and it will probably have some form of evasion already. So that's why I think Eutropia doesn't stick out to me too much, but I can totally see people uh, using it the way that you described, Max, to get some extra sort of surprising oomph. Perfect. So those are the uncommon legendary creatures from the set, but let's move on to some of the rares now. We're going to start off, of course, in Wooburg order, and we've got a card called Terranica. 
Yeah, Terranika, a Crowan veteran. So this is a 3-3 human soldier for white, white, one. So on rate thus far, vigilance, so you're above rate. Sounds good, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh... Whenever Terranika, a Crowan veteran, attacks, untap another target creature you control until end of turn that creature has base power and toughness, 4-4, four, four, and gains indestructible. So... Uh, I, I'm not <laughs> sure. Indestructible is great. Indestructible is very good. Base power four four like might be better than whatever it currently is, but it's on uh, attack, so we can't really control this. We have it's it's another white attacky card. I guess that's where I'm going with that, right? I like Daxos more than I like Terranika. Pretty good if you have a whole bunch of plus one plus one counters on yeah. something. So maybe you could actually like boost its power, but that's that seems like a pretty corner case. I agree. I think we're stretching to try and make Terranika good. This seems like it's meant for the constructed formats and not really for us. So let's move on to our next commander instead. All right. So we've got Thrix, the Sudden Storm. This is three blue blue for a four five legendary creature elemental giant, which I just love that type. It's got the best ability in magic called Flash. Uh, it's got flying and spells you cast with converted mana cost five or greater cost one less to cast and can't be countered. So I love the idea of just having this in the command zone. It may not be the best as a commander. It may be better in the 99, but blue is a really strong monocolor deck. And having like some big spells uh, that you can't counter, like, you know, expropriate or time stretch or basically any of the take extra turn spells, you know, I'm that guy. Uh, this card <laughs> is going to be a pretty good commander for that kind of archetype. Um, and, you know, you can play it when their defenses are down and then just run away with a game. I don't know. What do you guys think? I have two comments. First, the cost reduction on this particular card won't apply to overload costs like Cyclonic Rift. The overload cost is going to be separate from the actual converted mana cost of Cyclonic Rift, so you won't get a reduction there. You'll still play it in the deck, but that's just a quick rules note. And also, I want to go back to your very first thing that you said about this card, <laughs> Flash being the best mechanic. Flash is not pronounced Dredge, so I just have to disagree with you. What, what's better than playing your turn? Playing on everybody else's turn. Uh, I agree to disagree. I'm I'm not really sold for it, but I do like the build that you were talking about with Rex. That does sound pretty interesting. I do like that this captures X spells. Remember when an X spell is on mm -hmm. the stack, its converted mana cost is equal to colored pips plus X. So it's going to make your X spells uncounterable. If it's in the 99 and you can pair it alongside any of the big X game-winning spells, any of the finales from War of the Spark, Exanguinate, uh, Debt to the Deathless. Electro-Dominance. Electro-Dominance, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to protect those. That is definitely pretty interesting. And actually, I don't hate this at the helm of a sort of big C monster deck either, since those tend to be pretty expensive too. So there are definitely some small utility cases uh, that you can use here. And it's pretty compelling and also pretty rad art too, not going to lie. Yeah, like like to what Joey said, it's fun. It's weird that this is all spells. Typically blue, you see instants and sorceries, but this is counting your creatures and your enchantments as well. Yeah. Definitely a cool thing to be able to take advantage of those. Let's move on to our next monocolored rare commander. That is Ephemia the Cacophony. And I think that's the coolest part of the entire card is just the name right there. Uh, this is a two mana legendary enchantment creature, Harpy. It is a two one with flying and it says at the beginning of your end step, you may exile an enchantment card from your graveyard. If you do, you create a two two black zombie creature token. Hey, this that... is your mono black enchantress card, and a two mana commander is never to be trifled with. I disagree with just about everything you said. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually like this card in the ninety nine of a, uh, a Mogus deck. Uh, my co host Chris has a Mogus deck, which is pretty much all enchantment base. Uh, we need to kill a Blood Moon. He's just gonna get a uh, two two harpy when he exiles it. <laughs> That just doesn't sound like a very good payoff for having to make sure that there's a dead enchantment in your graveyard that you can then exit and then you get a two two like uh, no I don't I don't think we should spend any more time on Ephemia. <laughs> this this sounds legit terrible and any excuses that you're trying to make for it fall on deaf ears for Joey. Let's move on. I to already our got next like commander. six builds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so up next we've got Arasta of the Endless Web. This is two green green for a legendary enchantment creature spider. 3-5 and it has reach. 
Whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, create a 1-2 green spider creature token with reach. Okay, so in my meta, there are a lot of instants and sorceries running around. Like, that's a pretty good payoff. I don't think necessarily you want this as your commander. You probably want to put it in the um, the black-green spider deck. Uh, Ishkana? Yes, there it is. Um so I think this card is pretty good. The The rate on this for four mana is really good. Like, imagine you pay four mana for this, and you get, like, three chump blockers out of it as well. Like, that's a pretty good deal. Like, that's going to – and they all have reach, so it's going to be hard to get through that. Um, I think it's definitely a rare for, like, limited purposes, but uh, I think it's under-costed by about a full mana. And usually when I see cards like that, I, I kind of take notice. Yeah, I definitely like it in the Ishkana deck, like you mentioned, but at the helm of its own, especially if you are going for Spider Tribal, I don't know, relying on my opponents to do stuff for me to get benefit is always kind of risky when it comes to, uh, to to Commander for me, even if there are a lot of instants or sorceries. This doesn't strike me as the worst of the bunch that we've seen, though. This could definitely be interesting. I'm just personally a little skeptical, or maybe I'm just a little arachnophobic. You know, <laughs> I'm... That. <laughs> I'm always looking to do things outside of what I traditionally think the color pie wants to do, or I want to build an archetype or, or use a strategy that isn't typical of that color. And I think that this might give us the opportunity for some kind of mono green control deck that if anybody's doing anything like drawing cards, killing creatures, countering spells, what have you, tutoring, mana ramping, we're going to get what are probably going to be blockers because they have reach and we're just going to have an endless supply because people aren't going to stop casting spells at the cost of us getting a one, two. So uh, this might be a mono green control commander that I would like to build. It wouldn't be very good, but it would, it would certainly be interesting. All that I request is that you don't play it against me because I don't like spiders. <laughs> Ryan, can, can you tell us about our next commander? Yeah. Atris Oracle of Half-Truths is black, blue, two for a human advisor. So get your advisor tribal, you persistent <laughs> petitioners crowd out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Three, two. Three, two with menace, which is kind of weird, but whatever. When Atris Oracle of Half-Truths enters the battlefield, target opponent looks at the top three cards of our library and separates them into a face down pile and a face up pile. We put one of those piles into our hand and the other into our graveyard. So uh, like our second hand. So like it, it's it's fine no matter what you do, probably because you have access to black. But this card just screams f flavor and the Oracle of Delphi. And like that was one of the most powerful religious figures in ancient Greece for like hundreds of years. And this is that card embodied. And I just I love it. I actually really like it as a deck too. Like just sort of doing blinky stuff in a blue yes. black deck to get a bit of extra value. There's, you know, Conjurer's Closet effects that you can use. It sort of reminds me of Gonti in a way because Gonti is taking cards from other people's decks. Atris will be taking cards from your own. You might even be able to put this into something like an Aminatu deck, for example, since that deck does both blink and has a little bit of top deck manipulation so you know what's going to be in the piles. But really just the mini game of, you know, a face down pile and a face up pile, this weird factor fiction esque sort of thing is a uh, pretty interesting to me i yeah i i love the mini game and it's not fact or fiction it's a half truth or another half truth and <laughs> because they go into different they go into different places so even if you when you find out what both of them are you can't immediately with no other cost have all of the truth so it's never a full truth unless unless you really want to tune the crap out of this and make this like infinite blink dot deck so you can infinite half truth your entire library into your hand and graveyard and win that way it's, it's a cool card I, I just really want to like have uh, my, my co-host zach play this card and put cyclonic rift in the face down pile and have him not pick it <laughs> like i just want that story <laughs> I think this deck is going to be kind of more higher skill level to pilot because you want stuff to manipulate your top three cards like a top. So you always mm -hmm. know what three cards are coming your way when you blink. Ooh, that's Atris. good. 
Yeah, it reminds me of the cards, uh, the card Fortune's Favor from Eldritch Moon. It was a four mana instant that uh, forces an opponent to look at the top four cards and then separate into a face up and a face down pile. It's really interesting. It's a little quirky. It might not be the most objectively powerful ability out of all of the stuff that we're seeing, but there's a lot of subtlety that I think is really, really cool and makes a very unique experience. So I'd actually totally be into this as a commander. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next one. All right, so up next we've got Delacos, Crafter of Wonders. This is one blue-red for a 2-4 legendary creature, Merfolk Artificer. And uh, it says, tap, add, uh, colorless, colorless. Spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. And it also says, equipped creatures you control have flying and haste. And to me, it's that second line that really pushes this over the top for me. Um, I think this card is pushed. Three mana for this is really cheap. You're going to be able to play it from the command zone like an extra time or two. And being able to cast an equipment or use this to pay the equip cost of an equipment. And then it's got flying and haste. That's pretty crazy. Like any of the swords of X and Y are going to be like really good in a deck like this. And I, the reason I love this card is that it, it's kind of like what Ryan said earlier, which is it, uh, it kind of spawns a new archetype that we don't really have yet. And that's where I think this one kind of really shines. Here's a card that I really love for Dalakos. This is the enchantment Bludgeon Brawl. It's a three mana enchantment <laughs> oh, for yeah. Euphorexia that turns all of your non-creature, non-equipment artifacts into equipments that equip equal to their mana cost and give plus X plus zero equal to their mana cost. So Dalakos can actually turn all of those artifacts and then tap himself to pay for all of those artifacts to equip to people. I think that's really great. And it doesn't even matter that those equipments don't have other natural abilities. It's just a power boost because Dalakos will be giving you extra abilities. And I think that's really, really cool, especially if you compare with other awesome equipment like Hammer of Nizan, which gives things indestructible and auto attaches your equipment. This is pretty darn spicy. Oh, not you lie. guys are you guys are going about this all wrong. Two things. Okay, first thing, this is a fixed Joyra Weatherlight Captain. This is the artifice commander that they wanted to give us that is much harder to just infinite degenerate break. Second thing, I like this guy with zero cost artifacts. So you, you land him on turn two or three, whatever it is, and you just, like, get your bone saws ready. <laughs> and you just equip your bone saw, and you just beat in with flying. He's like a 4-4 four, four flyer with a bone saw. Like, that's yeah, super cool card. Ah, I like this one. Yeah, this is really cool. Of the multicolored commanders, actually, I think that this one might kind of be taking the cake uh, compared to some of the other options that we're seeing here. But speaking of those other options, we should talk about those. Max, you want to take this next one? Yeah, we have Galia of the Endless Dance. Uh, it's a legendary creature satyr for a red and a green. Uh, it has haste. Other satyrs you control get plus one, plus one, and have haste. And then whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may discard a card at random. And if you do, draw two cards. Um, I really like that they're kind of replicating what they did back in Kaladesh with Tapala, building a commander for a tribe that isn't really supported very well. Satyrs are known to be on Theros. You know, Xenagos makes them. Uh, there's a bunch of cards in this set that make satyrs as well, I believe. Uh, Annex does the demigod from earlier in the show. Um, do I think it's a deck that's going to survive in the wild? Probably not. It's going to be encompassed with a bunch of changelings, but it is really nice to see a, a tribe that's more uh, plane specific get some support for commander. I love that it's two mana. I hate that it discards at random. That's the real bummer for me. Yeah. I think if you have a high enough density of small, very efficient creatures like mana efficient creatures two twos for twos three threes for threes there's a point where you don't actually care what you discard at random you're going to be playing you know 34 35 land you're going to be playing all the most efficient creatures and efficient red and green card draw like that's what this deck is i think and you're just going to try and beat face or do something a little bit broken with with um like a past in flames or something to pump your whole team, maybe. I don't it, know. It, it's gonna really, uh, really suck if you end up discarding your crater hoof behemoths, though. Well, you're not wrong. <laughs> 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 All right, up next, we've got a Boros legend. This is Hactos the Unscarred. This is a four mana, and that's really cost uh, restrictive on this one. That's red, red, white, white for a legendary creature human warrior. He is a six one. He says Hactos the Unscarred attacks each combat if able and really weird set of abilities here. As Hactos enters the battlefield, you choose two 
three, or four at random, and Hakdos has protection from each converted mana cost other than the chosen number. So this is our Achilles of the set. He's got a weakness. <laughs> We're not always sure what it is. Achilles heel could be either convert a mana cost two, three, or four, and then he can't be dealt damage, can't be enchanted equipped, can't be blocked, can't be any of that, can't be targeted by any of the other converted mana costs, only by stuff that has two, three, or four, whatever you pick at random. I'm not really sure if I'm here for it. I kind of want to get your guys' take. Does this look like it's reinvigorating Boros, or does it look like it's more of the same? Okay, I'll, I'll this... jump in. Uh, so when I read this card the first time, I thought it was like when it attacked, it changed every time. Um, but it, it's it's one weakness that it's you know in the heal or whatever, and it's that way to stay once you cast it. Um, I don't know. This card seems like like I keep thinking about like what it's going to be like when it's in play. And I think it's just going to be really, really, really hard to kill. Like, And it's a six power commander. So there's probably some really good Voltron strategies here. And if you pair this with something like the um, uh, Sunforger equipment, oh, man. Now you're going to be able See, to protect that's, it, probably? Like, that's that's the problem, though, is that Hactos gets protection from all of those things, including from sources you control. So if you are going to try and go Voltron, you probably won't be able to reliably equip a Sunforger because he might have protection from number three, which means Sunforger can't be attached to it because it's a three-mana cost card. So you can't even equip well, an enchant it reliably. Point. That's a very fair point. I think, that you, I think that you run it with all of the blink effects that white has access to at whatever converted mana costs they exist at. And if you can just reliably blink him because you're running a density of blink effects, you can reset that and roll the dice again, admittedly, but you're rolling the dice to be able to kill somebody, right? Like you just put a couple equipments or a, uh, a pump spell or two on him and all of a sudden he's a, a two hit kill maybe? Once again, though, you can't put equipment onto him reliably, and pump spells, especially those that target, aren't really going to work. You can't even Chandra's Ignition this particular commander because he'll have protection from five. Like, it's just, it's really tough and unreliable. Rather, what I think you might need is stuff like Ghost Way, which can mass blink all of your stuff and doesn't require him being targeted, and probably also maybe stuff like Anthem Effects yep, that buff up that. his power. Because those don't target, and those can make him a bit more of a reliable engine. You know, a true conviction is going to make this guy a lot more deadly and really difficult to block, too. Because remember, he can't be blocked by other creatures that have those mana costs. This guy had me. He had me. He had me until you said Anthem Effects, and then all I thought was another attacky Boros Commandy. Yep. And that's kind of where I'm at, too. But... Because EDHREC is all about data, I did pull together a few interesting bits just looking at the top cards, especially the top instants, because those are those removal spells that we're going to care about, uh, to see which converted mana cost would be most ideal to protect yourself from the widest swath of converted mana costs, uh, widest swath of removal spells. Generally speaking, there are not a lot of removal spells at converted mana cost four. You've got Utter End and Death Sprout, and that's kind of about it in terms of the most popular removal spells. Converted mana cost two does have a couple more, like Assassin's Trophy and D Spark and Reality Shift are uh, a bit more popular. You never have to worry about Path to Exile, Swords of Plowshares, and Rapid Hybridization stuff with Hactos because you'll always protection, always have protection from converted mana cost number one. But what you would really be afraid of is if Hactos's weakness is the number three. If he doesn't get protection from converted mana cost three, then you're open to a whole lot more stuff like Beast Within, Anguished Unmaking, Chaos Warp, Mortify, Putrefy, Jennifer's Gift. There's a whole lot more at three that is a lot more popular. So if if you are trying to blink him to get an ideal number, I think making sure that he has protection from three is a good way to go. Yeah, and you know, you listed all those cards, and I heard cards from a rainbow of different colors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. There's interesting stuff here. I would be very happily surprised if someone's able to use his basically unblockability with his protection to sort of get through enemy defenses and surprise us a little, but there's some weird restrictions on this guy that prevent him from being as awesome as I think he really could be. Um, also, if you can't tell, I am stalling because I don't want us to talk about our next commander because <laughs> I do not like it. I was stalling too because I don't want to talk about it either. <laughs> well, too bad we have to. <laughs> very different reasons. So this is Kunaro's Hound of Athreos. <clears throat> and I don't know if I'm going to eat crow, if I need a suit of armor. I'm glad that Zach's not here. I'll say that much. <laughs> this is a legendary creature hound. 3-3 three, three for black, white, one. Vigilance, menace, lifelink. You decide which head has which ability. <laughs> 
Creature cards in graveyards can't enter the battlefield. Okay. Players can't cast spells from graveyards. Now that sounds a lot like another card I'm very familiar with for all of the wrong reasons called Graph Digger's Cage. Maybe you guys have heard of it. <laughs> Maybe we have, or as Matt likes to call it, Graph Doggo's Cage. Yeah. So your trepidation about this one stems from that whole awesome rotisserie commander draft from Vegas where you cast a Twilight's Call when there was already a Graph Digger's Cage on the battlefield and uh, nothing happened and you lost your spell and wasted Oh yeah, mana. six, six mana, discard a card, leave <laughs> everything in my graveyard and it was literally 14 inches away from my face. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's unfortunate. But also unfortunate is the fact that Kuneros exists. I don't like this dog. Don't play it, please. <laughs> I mean, I guess the good news is that it's, you know, it's probably not super great as the head of a deck. It's probably going to be in the 99 more often, so you won't see it every game. Yeah, it sounds like it might be backup for something, especially like the Obzon and Offenza, for example. Mm. Um, and I could see it being probably a decent hate bear sort of strategy um, at the head of its own deck. Um, but I also just never want to see it ever. It's a bad dog. I don't like it. This so, um, this card is going to be the helm of a an, an Orzov stacks deck, and it's going to attack you every single turn because you're not going to have creatures and you're not going to be able to block because it's got Menace, and it doesn't care about any damage it's doing to itself as long as it's damaging you because it has lifelink. And, oh yeah, and it can block because it has Vigilance. Yeah, like I said, bad dog. So we're going to move on to our cycle of gods. We've got a whole bunch of new ones, Heliod, Thassa, Erebos, Perforos, and Nylea. So let's start at the top. Max, do you want to tell us all about Heliod? Heliod the Suncrowned is two and a white for a legendary enchantment creature god with a 5-5 body. Uh, he, like the other gods, is indestructible. As long as your devotion to white is less than five, Heliod isn't a creature, so very reminiscent of Theros' past. Uh, whenever you gain life, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control. And he has an activated ability for one and a white. Another target creature gains lifelink until end of turn. I love this card. This is my favorite <laughs> card from the entire set. Uh, and I can see why. They made a combo engine, they did. Yes, they did. Walking Ballistas is my new favorite friend. Scumbags yeah, you, unite. You know it. Because you can give the Walking Ballista lifelink, have it remove a counter to deal a damage. It will have lifelink. You'll have gained life. You can put a counter onto the Walking Ballista. This is also repeatable with effects, I believe, like Triskelion. And there's a card called Spike Feeder. It might be Spike Weaver. I think it's Spike Feeder that you can remove counters from to gain life, which then Heliod can resupply. So if you're playing a green and white deck, you can use that combo too. Um, this seems pretty nasty, actually, and a lot better than the original Heliod. Yeah, for sure. I wish he flew. He's a god. He should be able to fly, right? No, that's not how that works. Oh. He's good enough already, Max. No. <laughs> All right, so the problem I have with Heliod is that because you can build it this combo engine way that we're talking about, it's going to be really hard to make it in some sort of super casual, non-infinite combo way, which is how I tend to like to make my decks. And so <laughs> if, if, if I play this card and, and I'm trying to play it in some normal fashion... I think I'm just going to get a lot of hate when I sit down to a table. And so that makes me like way less interested in the card. Um, so I, I don't know, like that's kind of where I land on this, but I mean, I think it's a really cool card. And even if you use it in like non busted combo -y ways, uh, there's all kinds of fun stuff with Crested Sunmare. So um, I think there's, ah, there's some cool stuff here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. Sometimes when things are, are too good although in a world of corvolds and chulains maybe we need things to be too good to fight back against the the, the might that is the craziness that happened in, in eldreen and all of 2019 but, but i totally get that same effect that you mentioned ryan because yeah sometimes when things look scary even if you don't intend them to be scary they get you hated out of the game a little bit so yeah, that, that does make sense. It's a, it's a cool card, but watch out, you know, try and measure your opponent's reactions to stuff like that, because if it's a known combo piece, you might have a little bit of superstition against it that you have to fight back against. All right, we're going to move on to our next god. That's Thassa Deep Dwelling. This is a four mana six five. She has the same conditions as the other gods where she's indestructible and isn't a creature if your devotion is less than five. At the beginning of your end step, you exile up to one other target creature you control and then return that card to the battlefield under your control. 
She also has an activated ability to pay four mana, that's three and a blue, to tap another target creature. When I first saw Thassa, I was not very impressed. I'm like, a oh, blink effect and a tap, that seems pretty overcosted. I don't know if I like it. And then I reread that triggered ability at the end step, where you return that card to the battlefield under your control. This is worded the same way as the card Conjurer's Closet, so you exile the creature and then return it to the battlefield, but that under your control is the really important part. It's not owner's control, it's your control, which means that if you temporarily take control of someone else's stuff, say with a card like Domineering Will, for example, you can actually blink it at the end step and return it, and then you get to keep that card. So I actually see Thassa not just as a blink thing where you can blink your mold drifters to get a bunch of value, but also as kind of a bit of a thief. Well, her her trident got stolen, so I mean, she's probably trying to steal it back. <laughs> her her Biden, first of all, but uh, yeah, well. she's pulling a Kiora now, exactly. <laughs> I really like Thassa. I think it's a really cool card, and I'm a huge fan of Conjurer's Closet as well. And this is one mana cheaper, so I think that's going to get a lot of spots in my decks. Um, also, I think there's a really cool interaction with a card called Chamber of Manipulation, which is two blue blue for an enchant land. And enchanted land has tap, discard a card from your hand, gain control of target creature until end of turn and so if you pair this with what joey was talking about you know five mana like just the land that you tap and then the four for thassa that's a that's an instant steal every turn and that's really huge right because you're going to be stealing other people's commanders and then their decks are going to stop functioning um this card could be like really mean <laughs> I, I, I'm totally, that's exactly the type of janky synergy that I am super here for. I absolutely love it. Okay, listen to this. I like this Thassa in the 99 of an Is It deck, and I'm going to call it Is It Threaten Effect dot deck. That's what I'm going to call it. I'm going to threaten your dude. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to hit you with it. End of turn, I'm going to bounce it and keep it. Ooh, I like yeah, that. Yeah, there's... There's so much going on here that I really like with the Thief aspect, and that's not even addressing all of the other traditional Blink stuff that you can put it into, like Rune of the Hidden Realm and Brago, for example. Yay. Maybe Lavinia of the Tenth will enjoy another effect like that. And I think if I remember correctly, Cedrus the Traitor King might even be able to use this too, because Cedrus the Traitor King can unearth creatures from your graveyard, and then they will exile at the end of the turn. But Thassa can blink them instead so they don't get exiled, and then you can put them right back into play because you'll have met the, quote, exile uh, satisfactory clause on Zedris, and then you'll be able to get those creatures back for even cheaper. Like, this seems like a really great interaction. I like this at the head of a deck. I like it in interactions with the 99. And while I am definitely tempted to build the Illyrios deck, if I'm going for mono blue, this seems like actually the better option from the Theros set. You can uh, put yeah. this in your Illyrios deck to make more reflections. You make a good case, Mr. Crandall. <laughs> Let's move on to our next god. Our next god is Erebos, bleak-hearted. It's three and a black for a 5-6 legendary enchantment creature god. Same uh, uh, clauses as all the other gods. He also has whenever another creature you control dies, you may pay two life. If you do, draw a card. And has an activated ability of one and a black. Sacrifice another creature. Target creature gets minus two, minus one until end of turn. I, this one was disappointing in my view from the original Erebos. Um, having that greed clause built in when a creature you control dies isn't as fun as just having it in your command zone. Plus, making all those, being able to shut down all those life gain decks uh, with the original Erebos was very handy, especially in my meta here locally. I gotta admit. Erebos isn't nearly as intriguing to me as Yawgmoth Rand the Physician. If I want to sacrifice creatures to draw cards, I don't really want to have to pay mana for it the way that Erebos does. I agree with you that I'm not as enraptured by this one. I love the name, and I love that it's very close to the original Bantu card, where you could uh, pay two mana, sack a creature to scry one and gain a life, or whatever it was. This one's similar, except it's a triggered ability but it gives you that sack outlet just the same. So if you do need that sack outlet, you can still draw your card or scry or whatever you have to do. This card's going to do it. This card is surprisingly good because it does give you the triggered ability option and it does give you the sacrifice option and being indestructible never hurts. My favorite part about this card is that the triggered ability doesn't cost mana, right? So this is going to make wiping your board a lot less appealing if you've got a pretty padded life total. So from that perspective alone, I really like it. Just saying, okay, we'll pay two life and I'm drawing cards. I, th I think it's actually pretty good. 
To be fair, it does trigger on tokens, which a lot of these effects don't traditionally do, so that can certainly be nice. I'm a little skeptical about it, but I would be happy if you guys to prove me wrong, because uh, when you're sacrificing your own stuff, that's something that Joey really likes doing as a necromancer himself. <laughs> so I'm definitely happy for the mono black card to be better than I think it is. Let's move on to our next god, though. All right, up next is Perforos Bronze Blooded, and this is four and a red for a 7 6 legendary enchantment creature god, indestructible. Uh, like Max said, it's got the same claws um, for the devotion. Other creatures you control have haste, period. That's fantastic. And then two and a red. You may put a red creature card or an artifact creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Okay, I'm actually really excited about this card. For some reason, I really love mono red decks. And um, I think I'm definitely going to build this one. This is like the card out of the set I'm going to build around. Um, I love my creatures having haste. I love that it's like a pseudo sneak attack. And... Um, I will say it's very carefully worded. It says artifact creature card or red creature card, not colorless Eldrazi. So <laughs> right, that, that's important, right? And uh, the first like kind of three or four cards that popped to my mind um, when I saw this commander were, um, uh, let's see. The first one was Cloudstone Curio, which is a three mana artifact. And it says um, when a creature enters the battlefield under your control or non artifact permanent, but in this case creature, uh, you may return another permanent you control that shares a permanent type with its to its owner's hand. So you can like sneak attack something really big into play with Perforos and then play some really cheap creature to return that the card that's gonna get sacrificed at the end of turn back to your hand and then do it again next turn. Right? And then when when you sneak in that creature, it's gonna return the little cheap one. So you kind of get to go like not ever having to sacrifice stuff with that card, which I think is really cool. Um, another card that like really immediately popped to mind here was Heartstone, uh, which just reduces the <laughs> uh, cost of an uh, activated ability by one. So now you're paying two instead of three to sneak stuff out, which is going to be really, really cool. Um, and then the other card is Sundial of the Infinite, which is a two mana artifact. And you can spend one and tap and the turn. Activate this ability only during your turn. And so these are all ways to get to keep the creature. So you're like cheating of mana costs and you get to keep it permanently. And that to me is just, ah, chef's kiss. Mwah. That's some really cool stuff. I do need to point out a particular uh, rules interaction with Heartstone, though. Heartstone says activated abilities of creatures cost one less to cast. So if Perforos doesn't have enough devotion, Ooh. it won't be a creature. With that said, with the amount of stuff that you can cheat out with this, I think you've actually got a really strong contender. And the obvious comparison to Perforos is going to be Ilharg the Raze Bar from War of the Spark because it also attacks and sneaks things into play, attacking with them and bounces them back to hand. The difference, of course, is that Perforos, you know, sacrifices the creature rather than bouncing it. But Perforos also allows you to get attack triggers, which is really big for me. That way you can actually get effects like Itali Primal Storm, for example, which has an on attack trigger, which given the timing on Ilharg, you don't normally get to get because the creature is already attacking when it enters. There's a lot of interesting uh, play between the two of those. I'm definitely here for Perforos for us you know what before before we move on to our last god though you do have to be very careful with perforos because you guys are right it is worded very strategically in that let's say you activate his three mana ability you put your atali or what have you in your devotion goes up to five or more and then he gets removed path to exile swords to plowshares etc your creatures don't have haste anymore the ability right. doesn't give them haste like Sneak Attack does or like Ilharg just puts them into play tapped and attacking. If Perforos is removed pre-combat, your creature can attack and that might have been a waste. So you do have to be careful. I think that this does want to go in an artifact heavy deck, not only to power up Perforos early with those fatties, but also to make sure that you're not turning on his devotion and waking him up. That's a really, really good point. I, I like all of it. This can see play in a lot of decks. It can see great play at the helm of its own deck. This is probably my favorite of the gods. I'm more partial to blue than red. I don't like attacking very much because I'm weird like that. But I totally see why this is one of the more compelling uh, commanders from this set. Let's move on to our final monocolored god, though. That is Nylea the Keen-Eyed. She's a 5-6 legendary enchantment creature god for green and three indestructible devotion to five green creature not creature you know the deal creature spells you cast cost one less to cast which is speaking my language as an animar lover i love that type of ability makes your creatures cheap shenanigans ensue 
and you can also pay green and two, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, put it into your hand. Otherwise, put it into your graveyard. <laughs> Ooh, Joey, Joey Schultz special there. Yep, that's exactly it. So it's so funny to me, Nylea, she's basically a legendary version of the werewolf Duskwatch Recruiter, which also has an activated ability to look at the top cards to find a creature, and on its flip side also reduces the cost of your creature spells. Nylea is just both of those things at the same time. Where are you guys at with her? Straight into Hogak, baby. <laughs> Uh, filling up that graveyard, especially for Hogax Delve or maybe the escape costs uh, from other things among the set. Yeah, that can be compelling. I think I'm a little wary of it as mono green, but I can see it. Did green really need another cost reducer? Or Absolutely. Or um, an accelerant? No, shh, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we got to move on, though, to our next pair of gods. Uh, these are the multicolored ones. I, Sorry, I'm hesitating on this one again because... I gotta confess to you guys, this next commander, I don't like it at all. And not even from an ability perspective, not even from a gameplay perspective. Let's actually read it out. This is Clothis, God of Destiny. This is one red and a green for a 4-5 legendary enchantment creature god. It has indestructible like the other ones. In this case, since it is a multicolored god, it has a devotion clause where your devotion needs to be equal to 7 for red and green for Clothis to be a creature. And this is where things kind of start to lose me. At the <laughs> beginning of your pre-combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. That is not a May ability, by the way. You have to do that. If it was a land card, you add red or green to your mana pool. Otherwise, you gain two life and Clothis deals two damage to each opponent. This is... I just... The design on this is so confusing to me. Nothing about this evokes the concept of destiny to me. That you have a slight kind of... Death right shaman ability ish. It's just I'm not here for it. I I feel like if the ability was random exile target card at random from a graveyard, that would play more into the destiny name a little because you're leaving it up to chance. But I agree with you. It feels very different from what we see out of Gruul typically. It's just not the kind of thing that I associate with the concept of destiny. When you look up cards that have the word destiny in them, you get stuff like angelic destiny or figure of destiny or radiant destiny. And they just have abilities that are more evocative of like, you know, a, a, something finding its true purpose as opposed to Clothis. Like on the reveal, the spoiler reveal that they had uh, for Clothis, they had a weird paragraph that I kind of want to read out to you guys that I just think is kind of a weird backwards attempt to justify the ability. It says, The god of destiny, Clothis, does not appreciate those who would manipulate fate, and her response is swift and final. If a certain someone were to attempt to escape the underworld, Clothis would do everything in her power to stop them. And I'm like, isn't that Athreos and Erebos's and even Kunaros's like, task to stop things from exiting the underworld? That's just a weird thing for the god of destiny to be up to in colors mm. that aren't Athreos's. I just, I just really don't like it from a flavor perspective and so that's what i'm harping on rather than evaluating it as a commander what do we think of it as a commander um i i think it does very unique things from what we've seen in gruel before i don't know if it's something i'd want at leading my gruel deck it doesn't do a lot with combat that's typically what gruel does stompy um but a four or five body for three is very very uh affordable and efficient in my opinion uh, I'm still not here for it. I kind of asked that question under false pretenses. I wanted to hear a no. <laughs> you set me up for failure, Joe. <laughs> here, I got you. This card's terrible. It should be a 6-6 six, six for three. <laughs> sure, something like that. I'm just saying, <laughs> I gotcha. bring back bring back Xenagos. That's the god that I'm really here for. Let's move on to our next commander. All right, so up next, we've got Athreos Shroudveiled. This is four white black for a 4-7 legendary creature enchantment god. It's indestructible and has the devotion to seven claws. At the beginning of your end step, put a coin counter on another target creature. Whenever a creature with a coin counter on it dies or is put into exile, return that card to the battlefield under your control. Okay, six is a lot to pay for this, but that ability is really, really powerful. Um, you get to do it on the turn you play it, and it also stops exile to me, which is kind of crazy. Like, you don't often see that. So I think this is kind of new territory. And anytime I see a card doing something new, um, it makes me, like, a little excited for it. And I love the fact that you can put it on opponent's cards and gain it that way, um, which is, you know, white and black. That's that's kind of a, a little bit of a color pie break there. I mean, not, not hugely, but I don't know. I, I think this card could be a pretty decent commander. What do you all think? 
it's not too much of a color pie break. There have been some other effects that allow, I, let's see, I think there's something like Undaunted or Tainted Pact or, or, or something like that that was from, I want to say, Avacyn Restored, but there's also a white card called, uh, a white card called Debt of Loyalty that mm -hmm. sort of regenerated an opponent's creature, and if that creature would have died, then you actually gain control yeah. of it. So this is actually something we've seen before. Yeah, and also Preacher is another white card that could do something like this, right? So uh, that's why I said kind of. Yeah, I'm, I'm really here for it. I love the protection from exile. Notably, you won't be able to take people's commanders this way if they go to exile or if they uh, go to the graveyard because people aren't going to do that. They're just going to put it back in the command zone. Even if you pat to exile something, putting it to the command zone is a replacement effect that will trump Athreos's coin counters. So don't worry about that. But stealing creatures or just protecting your own is a very versatile ability. And I could totally see Athreos getting a lot of play. He's the bio box promo, sort of like Kenrith was from Throne of Aldrain, uh, which is an important thing for people to note about its availability but i really like the set of abilities on this one this is really compelling this is an interesting card that has a bunch of build around space and i'm excited to see some innovative deck building with this card this is cool and of color pie breaking it should be noted that preacher was from the dark and dead of loyalty was from weatherlight and i don't know very many people who even were alive when those cards were printed <laughs> ah! <laughs> i, I we all were we all were <laughs> joey wasn't he was born like in yesterday yeah i was returned to like, ravnica i was born the exactly the year before like to <laughs> the day the year before magic was born so like how dare you anyway <laughs> let's move on we're done with all of the gods this was definitely a, a fun smattering of them but we've got a couple of other multicolored non-god creatures that we want to get to these are some really crazy mythics let's start off with pelucranos so we have Pelucranos Unchained. It's a legendary creature, zombie hydra for two black green with a base power zero zero. Uh, Pelucranos enters the battlefield with six plus one plus one counters on it, and it escapes with 12 plus one plus one counters on it instead. Uh, its escape cost is four black green and exiles six other cards from your graveyard. He also has the ability, if damage would be dealt to Pelucranos while it has a plus one, plus one counter on it, prevent that damage and remove that many plus one, plus one counters from it. And then for one green and a black, Pelucranos fights another target creature. That's a um, whole lot. <sighs> it is. Is this our fight commander, finally? Is this the card that we counter because it's got more than five lines of text? <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to counter it. I'm not going to listen. So escape is an interesting mechanic. I'm not sure whether I like it necessarily on Pelucranos, but we should mention real quick how it works. Escape means that you can cast Pelucranos from your graveyard. You just have to pay those costs, that being the six mana and exiling six other cards from your graveyard. And then he gets even more counters on him, which is certainly really cool. Escape is kind of tricky in that, like, if you do cast the spell with the escape cost, it's on the stack at that point, so people can't, like, exile Pelucranos in response to you trying to use the escape ability. That wouldn't work at all. So that's definitely a nice thing about escape. But if you've got someone with the Kunaros bad dog, then people aren't allowed to escape, and that's really, really mean. Uh, but as to Pelucranos' other abilities, being a big fighter that then reduces in power, I don't know. At the head of a deck, that seems really, really loose for me. It just doesn't... I don't know if I'd be able to get enough counters on this guy to justify it, even acknowledging the fact that green and black are excellent at plus one, plus one counters. This just seems like a whole lot of work for minimal payoff. The card I want to yeah, pair minimal, with this... Yeah, minimal hydras in black. <laughs> the card I want to pair with this is Mage Bane Armor. It's an equipment for three, and it equips for two. And it says, equipped creature gets plus two, plus four, and loses flying, and then prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to equipped creature. Right, so then you could just fight all day, not lose any counters, and uh, I, I think that's you know that kind of stuff is what you want to do with Polycrenus. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually a really good point when you start talking about other cards like vigor as well which prevents damage that would be dealt to creatures you control and replaces that damage with other plus one counters maybe i spoke too soon maybe there are actually some really good prevention of damage effects that allow predilknos to to be a whole lot better than he first appears i think you're definitely onto something all right, this is not the only escaper that we've got from this set, though we also have a pair of titans that are acting against the gods of Theros that are also attempting to escape from the underworld. Let's start off with Croxa. Yeah, Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. What a metal name, <laughs> right? 
For sure, man. So this is our this is our obligatory elder giant Highlander joke because it's an elder giant. EGH. Six six. <laughs> yeah. Six six for black red. Straight up. Six six for two. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. We'll go we'll get back to that in a second. Whenever Cruxa enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card, then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card this way loses three life. We'll get back to that too. It also has escape. Black, black, red, red, exile, five other cards from your graveyard. Wow. A couple notable things. It's second ability. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card. You do open up a lot of room to do the discard thing, the the Liliana's Caress, Megram. This part's hard to understand, though. Anybody who didn't discard a non-land. So I don't actually even know what that means. <laughs> that somebody loses three lives sometimes? I don't know. So essentially, when when you get attacked with this, you discard a card if you can. And if you didn't discard a land, uh, you're going to get hit for three. Yeah, that's so uh, weird. Oh, no, if you discarded a land... See, it's confusing. He's exactly correct. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're either going to take six or you're going to take nine, and you're going to be down a card, which is, in my book, sweet. A pretty interesting line of play here with the Titans is that you can cast this guy on, you know, turn two for the two mana, and you can sacrifice him and put it right back into the command zone to cast again on turn four. You don't have to put it right into the graveyard for Or the turn cost. three if on turn one you Sol Ringed. Well, yes, but if we're going to talk about commanders in the context of a turn one soul ring, then we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> I'm just saying it, it happens to be good. Not all commanders, even even soul ring on turn one doesn't always make your commander the best play on turn two or three. This guy it might actually be the case. It's pretty interesting stuff. I wonder how often people will actually achieve that escape cost, though. So the, the card that came to my mind when I saw this uh, is a card called Erratic Portal. Uh, this is a four mana artifact. <laughs> and you can spend one and tap return target creature to its owner's hand unless its controller pays one. And so I was like, oh, you know, you could put the sacrifice trigger on the stack and then bounce it to your hand. Just choose not to pay the one and then just keep doing that as many times as you want to and just keep hitting people, making them discard. I don't know. Seems like something fun to do. That's pretty mean. I You're love rude. that. I love that. Yeah, I'm I'm I want to sign up for that trip. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, discard at tribal probably seems the way to go. He's definitely achieving some crazy lines of play and he hits like a truck if you're able to get him out. So this one's pretty fascinating, but I would argue it's not nearly as fascinating as our last commander of the set. All right, this one's pretty sweet. This is Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. One green blue for a 6/6 six, six legendary creature Elder Giant. Uh, when Uro enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped, just like Croxa. Whenever Uro enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life and draw a card. Then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. And it's got that escape clause, green, green, blue, blue, uh, exile five other cards. Okay, this is a weird one. It's really cheaply costed, but obviously you have to sacrifice it, uh, you know. But here's the thing that I, I didn't see when I first read this, and so... Maybe folks out there listening uh, or watching will see this. Um, it's actually also an on attack trigger as well. If you get to do that every time you attack, that is really huge, right? If you can keep this in play somehow or get it to escape. Um, and the card I was thinking of to, to pair with it is like Hermit Druid to just get a whole bunch of stuff in your graveyard. Am I right, Elder Ryan? Oh, baby. Hermie D, you're speaking my language. So I, I don't know. What do, what do you all think about this one? This is more Simic uh, good stuff, in my opinion, and I can't wait to put it in my Shulane deck. This is just another card like Shulane, like Korvald, like everything else we've seen in blue and green, especially green for the last two years. It's like scrape a piece of gum off the bottom of your shoe, put a land onto the battlefield, draw 58 <laughs> cards. Like, I'm, I'm over it. I'm over it. I like listen, green, blue, one. Sacrifice my commander that I'm just gonna play next turn because I'm playing green and I get to draw a card, gain three life, and put a land card onto the battlefield. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna theoretically 
I could cast my commander and have leftover next turn. Like what's Name any card that's going to let me look at the top whatever of my library and put them into my graveyard in green because that those cards exist and I'm going to be able to cast them and my commander exile cards for my graveyard, pay the escape cost, draw another card, play another land, gain three more life. Like this card, this these kinds of things. I hate to be the negative person on the cast, but... Come on, Chulain, Tatiova, Uro, Oko, like, come on. Give me this, give us a break. Give, give White a break. <laughs> I don't know. Well, no, I, I, I thought that it was interesting if you blink it a lot, but um, I can see that I've uh, activated some feelings. <laughs> I don't disagree with any of your sentiments. I've lamented quite a lot about the design, for example, behind the card Chulain. Um, this one seems more fascinating simply because it has more restrictions, but I also agree with you that I would like to see something more original from this particular t uh, part of the color pie as well, because seeing more stuff like Tatiova is not necessarily always as interesting. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm totally over it, and I think that this deck, the other 99 cards in this deck, are way cooler than Chulain and way more original than just... Uh, Tatiova, which was just Azusa with counter spells, like it's fine. <laughs> this card's way cooler because it makes a, a cooler deck. So it sounds like we're on the side of the gods in this set, and not necessarily on the side of the titans. I well, I like Croxa. To say, yeah, I like Croxa, but this other god can go pound sand somewhere. He can beat it. All right, this is aggressive. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, so now I want to ask you guys which of the commanders we've just gone through a uh, whole legacies worth of them. There's so many uh, commanders here, but which one of them is your favorite from the set? Which one do you think you might build or that you think is the most interesting? Max, let's start off with you. I am definitely looking forward to building Perforos. Um, I'm mainly because I don't have a monocolored deck, and this will just let me play uh, big flying dragons and big creatures in red for three mana. Ryan Green, how about you? Well, I'm I'm on Team Max with this one. I'm definitely going to build Perforos. Um, I'm really excited about it. I think that uh, mono red decks are awesome, and it's definitely the place to be. And there's a lot of fun things you could do with this deck. And also, I just really want to do the Sundial of the Infinite trick. Like, that just seems amazing to me. I don't know. That's really cool stuff. And Ryan Peneff, when are you building Uro? I, I mean, uh, which commander do you think you would build? <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I was just going to say, I'm going to build Uro Titans of Nature's Wrath so because I, I hate all my friends. <laughs> no, no, wow. no. I'm going to build Atris Oracle of Half-Truths just because I like the mini Half-Truth game. I am super here for that. I think I already mentioned, though, the one that I personally have uh, an affinity for, and that's Illyrios and Raptured, because I just want Mirror <laughs> Tribal. I just think that's the, the funniest <laughs> darn thing. It's such good flavor. That that one really hits it out of the park for me, even though it's jank and I know that it will be totally, totally terrible. And you can, hey, you can trick people with that, too. You can say Mirror Tribal, and they're going to think that it's some Mirror Battlesphere <laughs> Tribal deck. You can totally trick people with that. You got them. You got this, uh, Joey. That sounds great. So, so separate question from which one you guys personally like. I also want to ask, since Idiotrek is all about measuring data and measuring popularity of cards, which of these commanders do you think will become the most popular? Not just your favorite, but the most popular. Max, let's begin with you again. Uh, pressure's on. I'm going to go with probably Uro, unfortunately. Really? Um, yeah, I just I have a feeling that people are going to figure out a way to break it in EDH specifically. In ways that they haven't already broken stuff like Tatiova? I'm not sure if it yeah. adds anything necessarily new to that particular conversation. So maybe that redundancy might reduce its numbers? Or do you think that this mm. one's just more breakable? I think it's uh, it's new. It's one of those that can go alongside. So, hey, my playgroup is sick of my Tatiova deck. <laughs> I'll just put her in the 99 and throw Uro on top for three weeks and don't change a thing. All right. Well, Ryan Green, what's your pick for the most popular? All right. I think it's going to be Heliod Sun Crowned. I think we're going to see a mono white resurgence here. I think that people like the strong combo potential here, and there's lots of ways to search up the one card combo that works with this commander. It's probably going to be pretty um, popular in CDH as well. And so I think maybe that bolsters its numbers. Um, again, you know, for all the reasons I'm not a super fan of this card, I think it might get a lot of traction. Th that's what I'm thinking. And Ryan Peneff, let's end with you. Yeah, you know what? I can't argue with your guys' theory behind why you picked what you picked, but I'm going to have to go with Athreos Shroud Veiled. 
And I think the original Athreos is monetarily hard to obtain. It is an expensive card at this point in time. And those Shadowborn Apostles decks just aren't going anywhere and people aren't doing anything original with them other than using the original Athreos. So I think that this one is going to be, despite being a buy a box promo, going to be the more affordable Athreos and is going to get your demons back when they inevitably die after you Shadowborn them out. I'm really, really compelled by that pick. Athreos, I was also really close to picking myself, but I might actually hand it to Perforos Bronze Blooded. The sneak attack and the ability to open up a few more doors than Ilharg does, I think is going to really appeal to the people who like to smash the face, which isn't me, but is definitely a lot of people. And I know that because I have played against them and they smash my face. And two people on this cast said they wanted to build it. So, you know, if you're just going by those... Exactly. (laughs) Well, that was a whole lot. This set is looking really crazy. 27 legends. That is so many from a new set. And some of them are uncommon and some of them are a little strange, but some of them are really spicy too. So it is definitely going to be really exciting to see what Theros Beyond Death does to Commander. There's a whole lot going on here. This was indeed an odyssey of a set review. On that note, I think we are going to call this episode to a close, though. You guys, this was just such an awesome, epic odyssey, and I'm I'm so glad that we could embark on this really ambitious crossover together. So remind everyone, where can they find you online, and where can they tune into your show to find each section of the review? Let's start with you again, Max. Well, Joey, first off, thank you so much for having me on the EDH Trek podcast this week. It has been a blast covering Theros. You can find me on Twitter at CMDRCentral underscore Max, and you can hear me twice a week on Commander Central. And Ryan Green. All right, well, my show is Commander Social, and I have to give a huge shout out to my partners, Mike and Zach. I couldn't do the show without them, and uh, they're here with me in spirit, so... Thank you that for that, guys. And also, Joey, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, this was amazing. And also, I wanted to give you like a huge kudos for some of the behind-the-scenes setup that you did for this. You know, the listeners maybe don't know that, and uh, you definitely deserve some praise for that as well. Um, but if you want to check out our part of the review, it was on Wednesday, and we did Artifacts, Enchantments, and Lands. And we had your very own Matt Morgan on the show with us as well. So uh, it's a good one. Definitely check it out. And if you want to find us, we're at Commander Social on Twitter. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Commander social and if you want to find me i'm at green geek and if you want to find zach he's at z4ck38 and ryan the uro hater (laughs) where can people find you yeah that's right you can find myself at cco podcast on twitter at cco brando for brando my partner in crime on commander cookout you can find us commander cookout on facebook commander cookout on youtube and of course commander cookout dot Com, where you can find all of our other social media coordinates, the emails, the Patreons, uh, other kind of smaller projects that we've got on the go as well are all found there. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDH Recast on Facebook and Twitter. If you have a question, a keen insight to EDH Rec's data, a challenge of stats pick maybe that you think we should know about, you can contact us at EDHRecast at gmail.com. Listeners, please let us know who's your favorite commander from Theros Beyond Death and which one you think will become the most popular. Guys, this was so much fun. This was an amazing set review. Definitely go back and listen to all of the other set reviews from this week to get the full Odyssey experience experience. But for now, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. And until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. By the way, am I putting the emphasis on the right syllable there? Is it Penef or Penef? Uh, it, nobody actually knows. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it sounds like you have carte blanche. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs>